Um, again, thank you very much for joining us. We, we really, really do appreciate it. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank you for asking me. Um, you asked me to talk about a topical uh, subject. What could be more topical, at least for lawyers, uh, than how are the criminal and the civil courts coping with COVID-19 and the uh, crisis? And uh, this crisis has hit the legal system as hard as it has hit all other elements of public and private life, social, uh, economic, and cultural. Uh, lawyers and judges have needed to learn how to communicate through Zoom, through Microsoft Teams, Blue Jeans, and all the other forms of remote uh, communications. This has caused embarrassment uh, for some lawyers. Uh, you may have seen that in Florida, a lawyer appearing at a remote hearing was criticized by the judge because she appeared on the screen, I quote, still in bed, still under the covers. And in the United States Supreme Court, they've been holding hearings by telephone, no video link, but by telephone. And there was considerable embarrassment because uh, one of the justices of the Supreme Court was heard to flush his lavatory during the, uh, the hearing. Uh, and then I think it was last week in the High Court in London, uh, there's a claim for damages against Barclays Bank brought by a fin financier, Amanda Staveley. And uh, at the end of her evidence, one of the bank's lawyers, thinking that the video hearing had ended, was heard to say she was obviously lying and the solicitors for Barclays Bank uh, had to issue uh, a very contrite apology. So what's the position in, in, in the courts and the top down? Well, the Supreme Court has held no hearings in its courtrooms since March. It's been hearing cases remotely and very efficiently. I argued a two-day case in the Supreme Court uh, remotely last week. The judges are each in their own homes. Uh, the technology worked. Um, the judges and the lawyers find it a more tiring experience than turning up in a courtroom because looking at a screen is very, very demanding. It's extremely tiring and it's difficult to pick up the body language of the judges so easily when you're looking at a, at a, at a screen, particularly when they're they are postage stamps uh, in the uh, corner. And it's much more difficult uh, for counsel to respond to questions from the court. Uh, if the judge wants to ask a question, he or she puts up their hand and you have to identify they, they have a question uh, to ask. But then it's quite difficult because if you need help from your solicitor, uh, you can't uh, be handed a note from them. They can send you uh, a message on WhatsApp, but it's very difficult to uh, argue a case and look at WhatsApp at the uh, same time. Uh, the Court of Appeal is proceeding almost exclusively by remote hearings. Uh, similarly, in the High Court, although there are some live hearings taking uh, place, reports suggest that the county courts have found it much more difficult to hear cases because they don't have adequate computer uh, systems. And there are much greater problems in the Crown Courts, the criminal cases. Uh, you may have seen that there are now over 40,000 Crown Court trials that are pending. That's the serious criminal cases. And there are nearly half a million magistrates' court hearings that are uh, pendings. Some Crown Court trials, these are serious cases, are not due to start until December of this year or into next year. And many of these involve alleged offences that were committed uh, last year or the year before. And that's very problematic, not just for defendants, but for victims and um, uh, for uh, witnesses. And the problem is that there are very few courtrooms that can accommodate a judge, uh, a 12-person jury, lawyers on both sides, court usher, 
uh, everybody else uh, socially distancing themselves. Uh, some trials are taking place spread over two or three courtrooms, but then that means that far fewer cases can obviously be heard. And you may have seen that on Tuesday of this week, the Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland, told the House of Commons Justice Committee that 200 extra court sites are needed to cope with the uh, backlog. Uh, I think it's important to look at these issues from the starting point of where the legal system was in March of this year. English lawyers are amongst the most conservative of professions in their working practices. Uh, after all, we barristers wear wigs and gowns, so we dress up as if we're still in the 18th century. Uh, it's true that more judges, more lawyers use electronic documents than ever before, and the courts were already dipping into the use of technology in that the Supreme Court and sometimes the Court of Appeal broadcasts uh, its proceedings. You can watch them on a, on a live stream. Um, but when the lockdown began, uh, English judges and lawyers were simply unprepared uh, for the use of technology. Indeed, I personally can't remember before March ever using Zoom or Microsoft Teams. I suspect many of you were in the same uh, position. Uh, now, like everyone else, uh, I am in the newly minted Yiddish phrase for those who've had far too many Zoom meetings. I am oiser gesumpt. That's the technical phrase, uh, so I'm told. And it's very much to the credit of court officials, judges, uh, that the courts have been able to provide any service at all uh, remotely. Uh, it seems to me, and you may want to discuss this with me, there are three main problems that arise, three main issues. The first of them is the need for accurate and up-to-date information about what precisely is going on in the courts. How many cases, civil and criminal, have been heard? Uh, how many in person? How many remotely? How many have been adjourned? Now, I'm a member of the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords, and we are currently conducting an inquiry into how the courts are coping with this crisis. And we've been told that there is, astonishingly, no systematic data collection. The courts and tribunals service, the government department, are simply not collating any statistics. And I find that quite astonishing because it means we all have to rely on anecdotal evidence, uh, on reports from interest groups such as the Bar uh, Council. And it does seem to me it's absolutely vital that we have accurate information so we can assess what needs to be done now and what needs to be done in, in the future. That's the first issue I wanted to emphasize. The second point I wanted to emphasize to you is that there is a fundamental question about what we should do with criminal cases. Uh, in Singapore last month, a defendant in a criminal case was sentenced to death uh, over Zoom. Now, um, we may be getting, we may be getting accustomed to Zoom meetings, but I doubt that any of us would think that major criminal trials should be conducted by Zoom uh, in this country. Preliminary hearings, perhaps, but if you're going to have a criminal trial where someone can be sentenced, not here, of course, to death, but to many, many years imprisonment, it's surely inappropriate to do it uh, over a Zoom uh, link. So very difficult decisions need to be taken and taken urgently about how the criminal justice system is going to respond to COVID-19. Uh, 
Uh, and um, the question really is, should more cases be heard in a magistrate's court where you've just got a bench of one, two or three magistrates and so social distancing is not such a problem? Uh, should we reduce the size of the jury from 12 down to six or seven uh, jurors? Uh, at present, there are criminal cases which must be heard uh, by juries because of their seriousness. And there are other criminal cases where a defendant has the right to elect to be heard uh, by a jury. And there are very, very limited exceptions to jury trial. Uh, there were uh, trials by judges alone in Northern Ireland for terrorism, alleged terrorism offences, and there's currently a law that allows a judge alone to hear serious cases uh, where there's a suspicion that the jury's been nobbled, uh, jury tampering. But subject to that, we proceed on the basis of jury trial for uh, uh, important cases. And the Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland, told the House of Commons Justice Committee earlier this week, it was on Tuesday, that hearing uh, trials by a judge and two magistrates without a jury would provide an extra 40% capacity uh, for the criminal justice system. Uh, and he said, if you reduce the number of jurors from 12 down to seven, that would increase capacity by only 10%. Uh, now, it's a very serious matter to do away with juries, it seems to me, not least because magistrates are older, they're whiter, uh, and they're more conservative uh, than the average uh, jury. The chairman of the bar pointed out that the average age of a magistrate is 58.8 years old, and only 6% of magistrates, 6%, are under uh, 40. So I think to remove the role of the jury in deciding criminal cases would be a very regrettable step. The jury is the community. The law depends on consent and the jury is an important protection uh, against those who impose the rules. I think it would be acceptable to say that if a defendant prefers to be tried by a judge and magistrates, then that's fine. Uh, if the defendant is prepared uh, to, uh, to do that. But I'm very doubtful that the rights to jury trial should be removed in serious uh, criminal cases. So it's a real, a real problem, a real difficulty. That's the second issue. The third issue I wanted just to mention is whether the experience of the courts in using remote hearings, Zoom hearings, during the crisis should lead to a permanent change in the way that we conduct legal business. Uh, the guru of remote court hearings, the man who's devoted his life to it, is my friend Professor Richard Suskind, who lives in Radlett. Uh, and he has said that until this year, until this crisis, he thought it would take a decade for courts to embrace technology. Uh, then he wrote, then the virus came, courts closed, and it only took a fortnight. Uh, the question now, as Professor Suskin says, is whether people really need to gather together in a building to settle legal disputes, civil legal disputes. And the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Burnett, has said he thinks there's no going back uh, to our old ways of working. Uh, this pilot project that's been forced upon us uh, is going to have permanent uh, effects. Uh, and I think that's right. I think it's going to mean many, many more remote hearings as a permanent feature of dispensing justice, not dispensing with justice, but dispensing justice. Uh, that does not mean that the Old Bailey will close down. 
It doesn't mean that the Supreme Court will close its doors. Uh, it means, for example, that preliminary hearings uh, can be conducted much more efficiently by a remote process. Uh, it's surely unnecessary for all the parties and all their lawyers to travel uh, to attend a physical courtroom and then wait to be heard for a 15-minute preliminary hearing. That is a very odd way, a very inefficient way of conducting legal business. And perhaps small claims too, perhaps when they're not complex uh, cases, uh, and that's true of the vast majority of, of civil cases, perhaps they can be conducted uh, online. So we need to look at the legal system and we need to ask ourselves what type of cases demand a physical hearing in a courtroom, uh, for what cases is a video hearing appropriate, and when will a paper hearing suffice? that you put in your legal arguments online uh, and the judge determines the case uh, online. There's gonna to need to be a massive investment in the court system to ensure that computer facilities support remote hearings whenever they're needed. And the courts at the moment, uh, particularly at the, the lower levels, simply don't have adequate computer uh, facilities. We're also going to need to consider uh, how a move to more remote hearings affects litigants who do not have easy access to computer technology. Either they don't have the hardware or they don't have adequate Wi-Fi. And there are also uh, many, many litigants who are simply not confident in the use of computer technology. Uh, access to justice needs to take account of these forms of what the experts call digital uh, exclusion. Now all of these problems, and they're real problems, also need to be considered, this is my final point, they also need to be considered uh, in the context of um, the state of the legal system before March 2020. It's not as if remote hearings have replaced a perfect system of justice. The traditional model of court hearings, civil court hearings in this country, is for many people completely unaffordable, it's far too slow, and it's incomprehensible for the vast majority of people who have the misfortune, and it normally is a misfortune, uh, to find themselves in court, whether they're a claimant uh, in a civil case or a defendant in a civil case. Uh, I have to say, with all my, what, 40 years of experience as a lawyer, uh, I, I, I would need a lot of persuading before I ever went to a courtroom as a uh, litigant. So this pandemic may have a positive effect. It's caused many, many deaths and many, many problems, all sorts of difficulties, as I said, social and economic, cultural and medical. But it may just have a positive effect in making us all think of ways to improve uh, access to justice. I think that's more than enough for me as a, an opening statement. I'd be absolutely delighted to try to answer any questions that you have on uh, this topic or any other legal topic or why Arsenal deserved to win at Southampton earlier this evening. Thank you very much. I think the latter might be a very hard case to argue. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> thank you very much. So just, just to remind everyone, the easiest way to submit questions is to either unmute yourself and ask or just put it in the box. If I can just uh, kick off using the, uh, the Arsenal Southampton, if you like, Lexus. Um, is there resistance uh, on, from the judges in terms of long-term change moving towards technology? Uh, it depends which judge you ask. I think the younger judges are far more keen on... Uh, improving access by computer technology uh, than the older ones. 
uh, if you look in the courts far uh, each year more and more judges are using their computer for access to the documents in the case whereas the old school uh, amongst which I count myself still like a paper bundle of documents we like to have the paper we like to write on it we like to color it with our yellow pen I appreciate this can be done so I'm told on your computer but I'm far too old to learn new tricks and that's true of many many of, of the judges but as the younger judges come through they are far more adept at computer technology far more sympathetic uh, uh, to it so I think in part not exclusively but in part it's a generational thing wow. and do they have say uh, in terms of like judicial reform in that regard you know technological advances do judges have say in, in terms of changes or it's imposed by, uh, by committees and reviews well, it, it, it's a bit of both. Um, it, it's up to each judge when sitting on a court whether they use their computer for access to documents or they have a paper bundle. That's up to them. Uh, the general structure of the court system uh, is decided either by the Lord Chancellor or more often by committees on which the judges have a very strong representation so their, their voice is heard. Um, but the, the legal profession, as I said, it moves slowly. Uh, and I, I think uh, if, if you went to a courtroom today and you saw the way in which a case is argued um, with the advocates presenting their case, most of them with uh, large bundles of documents in front of them, someone from the 19th century coming to watch uh, would recognize it. They would feel at, at home. So there, there hasn't been much of, of, of a change in, in the fundamental ways in which we argue cases. And the real question which Professor Suskind has posed is whether there should be fundamental change to take account of what technology offers. Okay, fantastic. Right, so there's some questions coming in on the group chat, if I can just uh, uh, give voice to them. Yes, um, please. Yeah, okay, so uh, Anthony's asked, if the choice is a continuing build-up of a backlog of cases in the Crown Court or online juries, aren't online juries better? Um, I'm, well, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer myself, but I have a law degree. I think you described that as a leading question. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not acceptable to continue with a massive backlog. Uh, I think to have online juries would lose an enormous uh, amount uh, of value in the system that the jury comes together uh, the jury looks at the defendant in the courtroom listens to the argument i think if each juror is is at home watching the proceedings i mean how do you know that the juror is concentrating is one particular problem and so i would much prefer that we look for other ways of preserving court hearings in their traditional form in serious criminal cases using a jury. And it may be that we'll have, the Lord Chancellor needs to find larger premises uh, around the country in which these criminal cases can be heard. That's much, in my view, much preferable to uh, the use of online juries. And that has started. The Lord Chancellor is slowly, I, I hope it can be speeded up, looking for larger venues uh, in which uh, these cases can be heard. Larger so that everybody can congregate, um, respecting social distancing. And I think that, that's much better than remote hearings uh, by, by jury. And anyone who's been on a jury knows uh, and I haven't, but my wife, uh, Nasty has, they, they, you, you know that the, the jury is a very special institution that you listen together, you watch together, you then go into your jury room and a rapport builds up and a consensus hopefully builds up, you discuss it. And I think if you do that by Zoom, all, all of that is lost and that would be very regrettable in my view. You're, you're muted, I'm Rabbi. I'm muted myself, gosh. 
yeah. well, first for everything. Um, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Ben, did you have a question? I did. I had a point I wanted to raise. Lord, Lord Panic, you referred to um, younger judges. Uh, I'd like to think perhaps I'm I'm in that category. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm at the bar. I specialise in uh, matrimonial finance, mm. and I also sit as a deputy. So I have. You say you have obviously you have more experience of the, of the higher courts. I spend my days trekking around the bottom tier county courts. So I sit in the southeast. I practice in the southeast largely M25 corridor, but frankly anywhere my clerks send me. You know the drill. Right. And um, Amongst all of my colleagues, we've our chambers has effectively become online since since COVID, as all of yep. them have. And amongst all of my colleagues and all of my judicial colleagues, and I, I want to make sure, Lord Panic, that you're aware of this, there is a huge disquiet and concern that this is, as you say, going to be utilized by a government who's keen on cost saving to move the court uh, uh, effectively online. And I, I hear friend with Richard Suskind. Um, Richard Suskind gave evidence, I believe to the select committee, I might have been wrong about that, where he said, and I was sitting in court on the day, where he said that uh, um, it was going well and he did anecdotally, people were very happy with the experience. And I was having lunch with the judiciary uh, that day, we spoke about it, and we were all amazed that he had heard that anecdotal evidence, because all the anecdotal evidence I have heard is that everyone is extremely unhappy with it. And, and can I just uh, ask, can I just ask, yeah, is, is, is that course. because um, the sort of cases you're talking about involve evidence, disputed evidence from witnesses, which needs to be assessed uh, uh, over a video link, or, or is it simply legal argument that you're, you're, you're presenting? And, and, and there are, I am, you spoke about being, um, I'll answer the question in a slightly different way. You, you, you spoke about judges being um, comfortable with technology. I consider myself to be extraordinarily comfortable with technology. I don't use paper, for example. I'm talking to you on the right. very iPad that is the source of my electronic bundle. Right. I do all of my work on this iPad. I do Zoom on the screen. I I'm not a technophobe, far from it. I'm probably the opposite of a, of a technophobe, whatever that yeah, probably is, yeah. technophile. Yeah. Um, the, the concern is multifaceted. But the overarching concern, I can give the specifics, it's probably too much detail to go into the, within the context of this conversation. Yeah. But the overarching concern is that there has been very little or if no proper consultation about this. Yeah. That's the concern. And so, um, for example, I don't know if you're a member of one of the, of the Twitterati, but the legal Twitterati out there. So the concern at the moment over the last couple of days is uh, the plan to extend courts for uh, evening early morning and weekend hearings to clear the backlog. Yep. The Family Law Bar Association is up in arms about that, I have to tell you. Uh, the other concerns are about, as you say, uh, the wider concerns about remote hearings are testing evidence, of course, very difficult yep. to do remotely. Yep. Although we're all, I've cross-examined many a witness who's abroad by video link, so you know, we're used to that, but rolling it out across the board is, is not great. Yeah, but it's never satisfactory, is it? Sometimes it's necessary. But Sometimes to, it's necessary. But to cross-examine a witness over a video link is, is a yeah. very unsatisfactory method of identifying evidence. But to consider the kind of work that I'm doing, for example, so I'm doing matrimonial finance work, and um, hopefully no one will ever have to cross my door or come across the kind of work I do. It's not pleasant. But yeah. we have a type of hearing which, Lord Pant, you may or may not be familiar with, called the FDR hearing. Yeah. Negotiation hearing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it, it is more commonly being rolled out amongst civil cases as well. But yeah. the idea of dealing with those remotely, a negotiation hearing at which parties are, are it's impressed upon them the need to try and settle, the arguments are rolled out, the, the court expresses its preliminary views in a, in a yeah. privileged, without prejudice way. It's, it's extraordinarily difficult to deal with that efficiently and effectively remotely. Yeah. Um, I have no difficulty, and I say this both from the perspective of someone who sits and someone who practices, short interim hearings, directions hearings, yep, yep. perfectly suited to remote hearings. As a judge, I've been doing them all on the telephone. Yeah. And that's fine. But anything beyond a very basic directions hearing, it's totally inappropriate to deal with them remotely. No, well, that's, that's, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I, I understand entirely what you say. I mean, I have a case on Monday, next Monday, yeah. 
in matrimonial finance before Mr. Justice Moore. And, right. uh, but it's only a preliminary hearing. It's going to be yeah. conducted by video. But uh, I, I entirely understand and, and I agree with your point that it would be very unsatisfactory to have the substantive hearing, uh, which will involve detailed and, as you say, inevitably unpleasant uh, allegations and denials um, heard over video proceedings. You, you want the witnesses uh, in court. Um, I, I think you're right. Part of the problem here is a lack of consultation. It's an aspect of what I've already referred to, which is the uh, the absence of, of, of information, of, of detailed evidence gathering. And I think you're also right that the crisis will encourage the Treasury, who, uh, oh, whose only concern is the saving of money, to think that um, uh, for, rather than pay for expensive buildings and staff in those buildings, uh, you just need a, a video link, which is much cheaper than the old style. So there are those, those dangers. Um, I'm not suggesting, I'm not, I'm not a fully paid up member of the Professor Suskin team. I'm merely no. suggesting that there are some hearings, such as preliminary hearings, which will continue to be done by, by video. But there are many, many hearings in the civil area, and you've mentioned some of them, which I agree would be wholly inappropriate. And I very much hope that there will be a proper consultation uh, before there are any permanent changes. Yeah, I mean, at the short point before I finish, just so you're aware, there's a strong concern amongst the district bench, for example, that the district bench are all going to end up dispensing judge, uh, judgments and justice from cubicles in large buildings with video links. It's you know, a horrible thought. It's a, a horrific thought. thought. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a terrifying thought. Yeah, yeah. No, well, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. So I, uh, thank you, Ben. Um, I, we've got another couple of questions. Um, Jeremy, you had a question? I did. Thank you, Abba Fine. Lord Panic, many thanks for, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, just before I ask my question, as a solicitor, I can uh, certainly relate to your, uh, your assertion that us British lawyers are uh, the most conservative of professionals. <laughs> that aside, um, my question relates to when you acted for Debbie Purdy in yeah. her challenge um the director of prosecutions in i think it was 2008 um when um you were looking at infringement of a human right rights for failing to clarify how the suicide act was enforced um something the law lords then i think accepted that she had a right to know whether her husband would be prosecuted if he traveled abroad and helped to, to commit suicide um keir starmer when he was uh director of prosecutions um, said, um, and I'm quoting here, that, that we've arrived at a position where compassionate amateur assistance from nearest and dearest is accepted, but professional medical assistance is not, unless someone has the means and physical assistance to get to Dignitas. Um, and that, to his mind, was an injustice that we've trapped within the current arrangements. So my question after all that is, how close are we to an assisted suicide bill, or, or in truth, statute? Yeah, well, it's a very interesting question. It's a very long-standing problem. As you say, Debbie Purdy, my client, suffered from multiple sclerosis. She knew it was uh, a disease, a condition that would inevitably lead to her death. She didn't know how long away that would be. Uh, she didn't want to, understandably, didn't want her suffering to be prolonged at the end of her life. And she wanted her husband, who cared for her, loved her, to be able to assist her to die when the time came. And under English law, that is a criminal offence. And what some people do is that they go to Switzerland to Dignitas uh, earlier when they're still able physically to go uh, so that uh, they, they can end their lives. And they have to do that uh, and shorten their lives from what it would otherwise be. And uh, I acted for her, as you say, the appellate committee of the House of Lords said that the DPP, then Keir Starmer, whatever happened to him, uh, he um, was obliged to have a policy in relation to these matters. But the issue hasn't gone away. Um, the law does not yet recognize uh, a right for a person at the end of their life to be assisted to implement their wish uh, to die. It's a very odd position because if I want to, 
uh, I am per and I'm of sound mind, I, I am allowed as a matter of English law, I say nothing about Jewish law, a rabbi fine will tell us the position under Jewish law, but under English law, uh, I'm perfectly entitled to starve myself to death. I'm, about to uh, I'm perfectly to entitled to jump off a cliff. And if I fail, I can't be prosecuted for uh, attempting suicide. It's no longer a criminal offence since 1961. What I can't do uh, when I'm incapacitated, uh, physically incapacitated, but mentally alert, I cannot say uh, I would like my nearest and dearest to help me to end my suffering. And I personally think that that, that that is wrong. It's a very difficult problem because you obviously have to prevent uh, people taking advantage of this to impose pressure on, uh, on Granny. Uh, the granny, isn't it time that we uh, assisted you uh, to die? I mean, you've got to be very careful indeed. And therefore those who propose a change in the law uh, take the view that um, this should only occur if the matter has gone to a judge who has satisfied themselves that the person who is afflicted uh, is mentally and physically able to make this decision. Um, you asked the question, how close are we? Well, I'm afraid I don't think we're very close. The courts have said this is a matter for Parliament, and Parliament looked at it two years ago in the House of Commons and voted overwhelmingly uh, that um, uh, the law should remain. Uh, a proponent of change and a very eloquent proponent of change uh, is Daniel Finkelstein, who you mentioned had um, been your speaker last week. And he wrote uh, what I thought was a very powerful article on this subject in the Times, uh, I think it was last week. Um, and he made many of, of the points I've, I've just uh, uh, summarized. And he said that he thought Boris Johnson was sympathetic to a change in the law. Uh, perhaps what we need is uh, for Marcus Rashford to be sympathetic to a change in the law and then maybe we'll get it through. Thank you. That's right, that's right. I haven't had many people advocating for Marcus Rashford to be promoted to the bar, but uh, you know, if that's what it takes to get, get changed, fantastic. Okay, thanks so much, Jeremy. Right, I think Professor Rosen had a question. Good evening, Lord Panic. Good um, evening. I, I, I practice in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, family and finance, counter fraud and counter corruption, and another, a, a few other matters, they're all inextricably linked, I would say cynically. Um, I welcome online court hearings. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, actually. Um, we, I'm currently involved in a case involving 90 defendants in a claim brought by the Kingdom of Denmark. Previously, it, it, everyone had to sit over th in three different courtrooms, and it was an absolute disaster. And all of a sudden, uh, just a few months ago, uh, using Microsoft Teams, uh, it, it, it just worked perfectly, and absolutely worked perfectly. Uh, one of my concerns in, in the lower courts, or in, in respect, for example, the, the financial dispute resolution hearings, and indeed in other smaller claims, where people's minds are focused uh, at the doors of the court to try and negotiate. It seems that we lose that opportunity uh, when, when we're going digitally, although I can see a way around it, but uh, how would you propose that, that those negotiations could take place? Well, it's a, a difficult problem. If you're, if you're not going to meet physically, you don't have the opportunity to look at each other, to uh, shout at each other, and then perhaps come to some form of, of accommodation. Uh, I can't see any way uh, of, of achieving that unless you ensure that um, the proceedings uh, in, in some form uh, involve uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, negotiation or we change our negotiating habits. In many areas of life, negotiations are not conducted face-to-face, -face, they're conducted online. And if you're negotiating to buy a house, um, you, you, you start off with your offer and the vendor tells you how much they want and you, you negotiate. So you very rarely meet them, at least in my experience. Um, so it is possible, but I agree with you. There are advantages of face-to-face um, -face, uh, hearings. That's one of them. Uh, I think it's a question of assessing whether those advantages really justify all the costs and expense of everybody coming together in a physical 
in a physical courtroom. But your, your question and the um, competing questions that were put by, uh, I think by Ben Fearnley just a few moments ago, demonstrate just how controversial this is, that both of you are operating in different areas of, um, uh, of matrimonial finance, and you take radically opposite views as to the merits and defects of this system. And this is part of the problem, that one really needs to have the most careful possible assessment of all the advantages, and there are advantages, and all the disadvantages, and there are disadvantages of moving uh, towards remote hearings and in what areas. The, the position at the moment is that remote hearings have been imposed upon us, uh, and they've been imposed upon us because the alternative was, uh, in many cases, no hearings at all. So uh, that's why we're, we're where we are. But for the future, I think we, we do need to consider advantages and disadvantages. And my position at the moment, my position is I think that there uh, is room for remote hearings, but I'm far from convinced uh, that they're appropriate for uh, substantive uh, determination of issues uh, that turn uh, on credibility, for example, uh, where witnesses need to give evidence. But I can see that uh, um, it is possible to conduct hearings uh, even where you've got witnesses, even where you've got credibility online, it is possible. And some people say that it's easier to assess whether or not the person who is talking is telling the truth if you're looking into their face close up uh, than if they're six or eight feet away from you uh, across a, a courtroom. You know, I, I can call up whichever of you is talking and I get a pretty big picture of you and I can gaze at you without the social embarrassment that um, a judge or juror would have if they were gazing at the at the witness in the same intense manner. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I just ask one last question on a of very course. much lighter note uh, where you have a, um, an excitable uh, advocate, do you ever feel the need to press the mute button? <laughs> Well, there are a lot of very excitable uh, advocates. There are people who shout and scream. There are people who pace up and down. Uh, I, I personally don't think that is very effective. I find the, the, the best advocacy, advocacy from a judge's point of view, and you'll uh, tell me, those of you who are judges, whether this is right, is the advocate who is calm and reasoned and recognizes the weakness some of the points that are being made and the strengths of the points that are being made uh, against them. Sometimes it's difficult though with, um, uh, with all the pressures imposed by your client, the judge and the other side not to get excitable. But I, 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 I try to adopt the approach that I'm calm and collected in court and I save my uh, emotions and excitability and shouting till I come home. <laughs> Good. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, really thank you. Look, fantastic questions and thank you for your time, Lord Panic. We look forward to seeing how things will, I guess, proceed and progress. Uh, progress, I guess, depends on your point of view, what you call progression, it seems, but uh, you know, how things will unfold. Um, just to remind everyone, we're going to put this on our YouTube channel.